I mean, I remember the day I got laid off. I did everything I could to hold my job, right? I was performing at my peak. I was doing a lot more than I was asked. And the biggest reason why I was worrying is because just a couple months prior, I had proposed to my girlfriend and we were supposed to get married. And the first thing I did was I called every single engineering firm that we worked with, every other architecture firm, and I was just literally begging, like, are there any openings, please? Like, because I couldn't imagine life doing anything else because it's it was my passion. There was one podcast called Internet Business Mastery. It changed my life. And they interviewed Cornelius and he was talking about how he was making six figures a year online by helping people pass project management exam, the PM exam. I just ended up building a website to help people pass that exam. I launched my study guide for that audience, that small audience that I built there. And it had made $7,908.55 from a $29 ebook. I didn't even know what an ebook was. And then immediately I thought, oh my gosh, this is life changing. And then the income just continued to grow more and more and more. And eventually people started to see what I was doing and say, Pat, how did you do that? And that's where Smart Passive Income was born, to help others and show others how this was done. Pat Flynn is a serial entrepreneur and host of the Smart Passive Income podcast. Today, Pat discusses how to actually build passive income. I'm Erica Kohlberg. This is Erica Taught Me. And today we're here with Pat Flynn. So Pat, now you're known as the Smart Passive Income guy, but years prior, you were laid off from your job. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of what got you started into exploring passive income. What was that like? What was going through your head at that point? I mean, I remember the day I got laid off. Uh, I didn't want to get laid off. This was 2008 and a lot of people got laid off. I didn't think that I was going to. I did everything I could to hold my job, right? I was performing at my peak. I was doing a lot more than I was asked of. I was working at an architectural firm. It was my dream to start a architectural firm uh, when I was older and then to go into my boss's office sit down and have him say, you know, Pat, you're one of the youngest, brightest guys I know, but unfortunately we have to let you go. It was, it was, it was a blow. I, it reminded me of when I fell on my skateboard when I was a kid and I like got the wind knocked out of me and I couldn't breathe. Like that's how I was feeling. Like somebody just punched me in the gut. And my first reaction was, well, I couldn't believe this. Is this for real? Like, is this a joke? And then it turned into anger and then it turned into worry. And the biggest reason why I was worrying is because just a couple months prior, I had proposed to my girlfriend and we were supposed to get married. And now everything was changing. So I went back to my desk and the first thing I did was I called every single engineering firm that we worked with, every other architecture firm, and I was just literally begging, like, are there any openings, please? Like, cause I couldn't imagine life doing anything else cause it's, it was my passion. And um, to have worked so hard for something and to still get let go, um, I know it wasn't my fault, but it just, it just hurt a lot. Um, so I was begging and pleading. I was like, I'll, I'll do anything. I'll do executive. Like, it doesn't matter. I just want to be in this space. But when they weren't letting me back in, um, I realized that this was going to be like a permanent thing for a while, at least. So I went back to my apartment. My fiance was going to come in a couple hours later and she did. And she saw me crying like in the bed. And uh, I had texted her earlier that I was you know, getting laid off. And she came over to me. She didn't say a word. She just gave me a hug and said, eventually, we're going to be OK. And to just hear those words, we are going to be okay, just took away most of the worry that was in my head, right? Were we going to still be together and all this stuff? You know, our brains tend to think of the worst case scenario. It's sort of a survival instinct, right? Like we come across an animal where we think it's like very dangerous so we can keep safe. Well, in this case, I thought that she was going to leave me and I was going to end up homeless and, you know, I disappoint my parents. Uh, but none of that was true, even though I thought it for sure. Um, luckily, because I had a certain level at my job, I wasn't let go that day. So they had to kind of like slowly let me go and transition my clients to, to other people. So I had some time, like a month and a half to kind of figure things out. And I remember I actually ended up moving back with my parents. My fiance moved back in with her parents because I'm half Filipino. My wife's Filipina. And when you ha have a wedding and you're Filipino, it's going to be a big wedding. It's going to cost a lot of money. And there's going to be people there that you don't even know because your parents <laughs> brought them. And so we're like, OK, we got to save money. So that was hard, too. It almost felt like going backwards in life, going like I love my parents. I was thankful that they kind of let me crash, but uh, it didn't feel like I was going the right way. How old were you? I was 25. And again, I had my whole life planned out and then rip. It just got kind of taken away from me. Well, I remember taking the train because it was cheaper than driving. Uh, up to Irvine from San Diego. So I took an hour and a half to two hour train ride every day to go to my last final days at work. 
And I remember sitting on, on the train and watching people come in with their briefcases and their laptops and feeling so jealous, like you still have your job. And I was making up stories about how happy their lives were and how unhappy my life is when, I mean, I had no idea what their lives were like. All I could think about was I, I need a job, I need to make money. And there was actually one moment where a person randomly came over and um, said, hey, you know, you wanna learn about these money-making opportunities that I have? And I said, yes, I don't care what they are, I'll, I'll check them out. So I ended up going to this meeting and it became this pyramid scheme. I'm not gonna mention company names, but I ended up getting uh, almost roped into some, you know, selling lotions and medical things to my family and friends. And I was just like, I don't wanna go down that path. Now, I'm very lucky at the time because this is right when podcasts were coming out. And there was one podcast called Internet Business Mastery. It changed my life. So when I heard this podcast, there, like I think it was the first episode I listened to. There was an interview with a guy named Cornelius Fitchner. The hosts were Jeremy and Jason. And they interviewed Cornelius. And he was talking about how he was making six figures a year online by helping people pass the project management exam or the PM exam. And essentially, people would sign up to his course or buy his study material and he would get paid and they would get it automatically delivered to them. And I was just like, this is fascinating. I can't believe this is real. Could I do this too? And I remembered, wow, I took a lot of tests when becoming an architect. And there was one in particular that was very difficult that didn't have a lot of exam materials called the lead exam. And I just ended up building a website to help people pass that exam. It did way better than I ever thought it would. Uh, I had no idea what I was doing. But to fast forward to October of 2008, um, I was told I was going to be let go in March. Uh, but the same month that I was permanently let go was the same month I launched my study guide for that audience, that small audience that I built there. And it had made $7,908.55 from a $29 ebook. An ebook. I didn't even know what an ebook was. <laughs> uh, it was so new at the time. And then immediately I thought, oh my gosh, this is life changing. And then immediately my mind changed to, oh my gosh, the FBI is going to come and knock on my door because this does not feel like this seems way easier than I thought it was going to be. I must be doing something illegal or wrong or I don't know. And of course, the FBI never came. <laughs> knock on wood. That's I've always followed the rules. I try to. And then the income just continued to grow more and more and more. And eventually people started to see what I was doing and say, Pat, how did you do that? And that's where Smart Passive Income was born to help others and show others how this was done. The reason why it's passive income actually is because that was the keyword that was available at the time. That's really the main reason why it was there because it was a highly searched volume keyword that allowed me to get in front of people who were looking to understand how to make money online. And there were so many people teaching this stuff that were scammy and snake oil salesmen. Mm -hmm. and, I, and thankfully I found a couple people in Jeremy and Jason in that show that were, were awesome and I could trust them. And I knew I could step up and be another trusted source I wasn't an expert, I was figuring it out as I went. I just wanted to have a public space to share what was going on and what I wish I would have done differently. And you know, fast forward to today, uh, here I am with you, Erica. Um, I'm keynoting events, I've written books, and I have made over $7 million since then. It's been absolutely life-changing. I've been able to build schools and places around the world and do all these things that I never even thought possible all because I got laid off. So thank you to my boss. Thank you uh, for letting me go. And as some people have said, you know, getting rid of that uh, ball and chain that I was tied to in, in the corporate world. Yeah. Which I know you could relate to. And for people who don't know, it's just background. The difference between passive income and active income is active income is what we're all used to when we go to our nine to five. We trade our time for money. Passive income is you may put a lot of time or money up front with the hope that you'll be able to reap those benefits monetarily going down the future. Exactly. What do you think are the biggest misconceptions when it comes to passive income? The biggest thing is that it's actually totally automatic and you just have to press a button and then it's gonna happen. It's not true. In order to get to passive income, you have to start with very active sort of uh, income. And, and it's not active in a way where you trade eight hours of time and you get paid for eight hours. You might dedicate hundreds of hours into something and got, not get paid anything up front as you are building, as you're creating an audience, as you are proving yourself, as you're sharing your expertise and putting, you know, building an audience on these platforms. And then you can, I don't even like to say cash in, then you can, then you can begin to serve your audience with opportunities like courses or consultants, consult, consulting or software even. I mean, I think that, you know, the biggest mistake that a lot of people make when trying to start a business online is, well, what should I sell? That's the wrong question to ask. The question to ask is, 
who am I serving and what do they need help with? And in, in my world of architecture, people were needing help passing this exam. And that's something I knew and I could bring to them. Um, but it didn't happen overnight. I think a lot of people think this happens overnight. And it's not 100% forever you build it and it's going to work forever. I mean, there are there are a few things that are like that, right? Royalties to books and other media, movies and whatnot. But you still got to upkeep what's going on. I mean, some people call real estate passive income and it is in a sense, but the market's always changing. You have to upkeep your properties and such. So it takes some awareness of what's happening to keep it going. But I could take a week off, I could take a month off and the businesses continue to run. And they continue to run because there are software that can deliver things that people pay for automatically without me having to touch it. Um, and in some of my other businesses, because I own multiple, um, where there is a human touch needed, it's just not me. It's a team or somebody else, uh, maybe on the other side of the world, helping to make sure things get delivered and whatnot. But I think that distinction is really, really key, active. The, the beauty of the internet is it, it has allowed us to asynchronously serve others. So you can, like you said, dedicate some time up front, reap the benefits later. Some of that stuff has a very long tail um, opportunity to continue to profit over time. I mean, people are still going to that website that I built in 2009 or 2008 wow. and are still making purchases. And I'm still seeing a couple thousand dollars a month from that, from work I did, a lot of hard work up front back in 08. And um, I mean, I must have dozens of things that are kind of acting like that right now. Um, but you got to get started. It's not easy. You need to get help. And you're going to have no idea what you're doing and it's scary and it's different. And your parents are going to be like, go get a real job. Like that's kind of the thing I got. Yeah. Uh, I know you got the same thing and, and we're worried about that, but it took a little bit of time. And I think we're in an age now where, yeah, wow. I mean, you could be a TikToker and make money, which is, that's like, I feel old thinking that, wow, you can really do that now. Cause that's what people thought about me when I started. Are you on TikTok yet? I am on TikTok more as a consumer. It's my like, it, it's it's fun. <laughs> <laughs> what are your different passive income streams and active income streams that you have right now? So right now I have uh, websites that are available that people can go to to um, purchase or get solutions to problems that they might have. Right. So that architecture website is up there um, on smart passive income. I have different courses available. So online courses are great because you you build the online course and people can come through them whenever. I mean, I have people searching for how to start a podcast all the time, for example, and they might come across my promotional page and then go into my course. And then by the end of it, they have a podcast and it's up on all the platforms and they're building audience. Um, the key with anything that you sell is it has to transform your audience, right? I, I had considered creating an all-in-one like, hey, I'm going to create the online course that includes everything, podcasting, email, affiliate marketing, whatnot. But people have a specific problem and they want a specific solution. Right? There's a story about a guy who created a universal bug spray. Right, It killed every bug. He brought it to the store, put it on the, on the can. It said, killed all bugs. Like That's attractive. It, sold, it didn't sell at all. Nobody bought it. He took the same solution home. He relabeled the bottles as, here is the cockroach spray. Here's the ant spray. Here's the, you know, uh, the fly spray or whatever. And they sold. Because people have an ant problem, people have a cockroach problem, people have problems with flies at their home. So they're going to buy the solution for that. And especially today with so much noise out there, it's really important that people know what you can do for them and specifically to the problems that they have. So we talked about these websites and online courses. I also have what's called affiliate marketing, which I think is the easiest way to generate an income online, the easiest to start with, because you don't need to create the product. You just need to point people to the right products that already exist. So if you have an audience and you know what their goals are, right, um, you could just say, hey, I use this product. I endorse it. I love it. Here is my link, which then connects it to your account so that when a person becomes a customer, um, that company will pay you as like a commission. So thank you. And I know you do some affiliate marketing and it's again, you could get started with that today if you wanted to. Yeah. We all recommend things to, every, to our friends. What if you got paid for that? Right. But there's a big problem with that because. You can choose any product and promote it and make money from it. Many people just choose products because it has a really high commission, because it's going to make them a lot of money. But what's en what ends up happening is in the long term, people start to see that, well, you're just promoting things because it's making money, not because it's actually helpful. So always start with service to your audience in mind first. Serve first is one of my phrases. It always pays you back in one way or another over time. Yeah. Um, 
software. I have some software in the podcasting space for different players on websites and hosting and whatnot. So that's another income stream. Uh, I've written books. I have three books now. I'm in works uh, with a proposal for another one right now, which is really exciting. But these books, all the way published back from uh, 2013, continue to sell every day. And again, that hard work put up front to create something valuable continues to help people today. Um, So I have those books. Um, Those are more passive forms of income. Uh, More active forms of income today is I coach people and uh, one-on-one and I consult various businesses. And of course, if I don't show up on that call, then I can't help them. So it's very active. I have to be there. I am trading my time for money in that case. How do you decide when active income becomes worth it? Because I'm kind of in my phase where I don't want to do anything active income. I'm in the building passive income phase. Yeah. So it's I mostly turn down active income opportunities. And that's totally okay. That's totally okay. I think it depends on what lights you up, right? And, and I think that's a really important question everybody needs to ask themselves, right? What lights you up? That's actually the first question I always ask people when I meet them. I'm not like, what do you do? I'm like, what lights you up? That tells me way more about a person than just what, career they have, right? And then it eventually gets into career. But anyway, I do one-on-one consult consultations and coaching because I just really want to help those people, right? And these are people that I've had a relationship with for a while, who have taken my courses, who have gotten to know their business. I know the impact that they have, and I can impact people through them in a way, right? There's that ripple effect, and I can help make their ripples even bigger. And through them, I'm able to help even more people. So that impact is important. It's like, I'm, I'm, I'm so grateful to say it's not about the money anymore. It was at first. At first, it was like, I just need to survive. Yeah. Right? Like, when you left your corporate job, it was like, well, how am I going to pay for all the stuff I need to pay for now? Uh, again, we're at a point now where we can be, we have options. And, and that's really what passive income can allow. Because now I choose to coach these people. I choose to do these consultations. I choose to advise these companies in the creator space because that's what lights me up. Mm-hmm. And, and I just am so happy that I can do that versus... Well, I just got to make ends meet. So I'm going to do something that my boss tells me to do uh, and miss out on things in my life that I wish I didn't. Right. So, um, yeah, that's how I that's how I choose. It's it's really important. Actually, this is the first part of my book. Will it fly? My book, Will It Fly? is about how to choose the right business idea for you, how to know it's proven that this will work out when you do the work. But the first half of the book is, well, who are you? What? do you do what are your special talents what like what are these filters that we should create that allow you to know when to say yes and know when to say no because then whatever it is you end up doing is going to fit into the thing that's going to light you up versus what i i know a lot of entrepreneurs say yes to the first opportunity that comes around because it's they're worried that another one's not going to come and then fast forward five years sure they might be making a lot of money sure they might be you know uh inc 5000 company But they're unhappy because they're just doing something that is just actually it's just making money and that's that's all it is right um how do you choose um what to focus on is in terms of i mean i know you're focused on passive income right now but even in then there's dozens of ways you could go like how do you choose which way you go i care about impact a lot now so i'm thinking about my time in terms of with this hour I have in my day, how can I impact the most number of people? And right now that translates mostly to social media content. So I'm spending a lot of my time creating the videos, creating the podcast. I think my mindset has shifted as the financial situation has changed. Mm -hmm. When I first quit my job, it was kind of figuring out how I could validate that I would be able to make enough money to, to live and not have to go back to a law firm. Sure. So back then, I was trying everything. I think I discovered your Smart Passive Income podcast right before I was going to quit. And it planted the seed in my mind that, oh, ebooks are the best way to make passive income. So I don't think I've ever told this story. And I hope people don't search it and find this book. But I was living in Tokyo, Japan at the time. And I started our, there was the Rugby World Cup happening. And so I decided to create a complete Japan guidebook on the Rugby World Cup. I've never watched rugby in my life. So I had to just research about rugby, find the different stadiums that were happening and try to sell this ebook. And I don't think I made any money. I think I probably put a full month into it and maybe sold 10 copies at $10 a piece. But the learning experience of 
learning how to build a website, learning how to create the ebook, learning how to format it, learning how to use Facebook ads to Mm -hmm. get paid traffic, building up an email list. Like there were so many things that I learned from that little experience that all in all, I see it as a huge win. I mean, I I basically went through a mini MBA just doing that. (laughs) Yeah, by putting yourself in that situation. I mean, the, the... the rewards far outweigh the risks when it comes to the online space to be able to try something. But I still know it intimidates people to kind of create something and maybe feel like that's a waste of time. Yeah. But I love how you're thinking about it as well. Sure, I didn't make a ton of money from it, but it's lessons that will make help me make more money down the road. But I did it secretly too. I didn't put my name on it. it I created some kind of company. What were you to, worried about? Why, why didn't you put your name oh, on it? Oh, of course I was going to be embarrassed if someone from the law firm saw it and said, wow, like Erica used to be this top corporate lawyer and now she's selling ebooks on Rugby World Cup. <laughs> like, yeah. I didn't want anyone to see this little experiment. It's so funny you mentioned that. I mean, the the amount of weight that we put on what other people think of us is is... I mean, I don't know where that comes from, childhood or, you know, our cultures or whatever. It's just so hard to get through that. And 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 that was very difficult for me becoming an entrepreneur because I thought it was a failure and I didn't want to let my parents down. And even as I became an entrepreneur, there were moments where there were trolls and haters who came about who, you know, were so upset at their own choices that they had to bring down other people. And at one point there was a comment on one of my blogs that just tore me to pieces. And, um, you know, I learned, okay, if there's a comment like that on your website, just delete it. The problem was this person took this comment and pasted it on 50 other websites where I was featured as a, a podcast guest or a, a blog post guest. And so I woke up the next morning and my friends and colleagues were saying, hey, who's this guy talking like smack about you? He's just going on this rampage. And I quit. I quit for a whole month. I didn't post any content. I didn't want to be online. I just didn't want to be in this world. And then I'm very grateful because I have a friend named Derek who reached out to me. He was worried. He said, Pat, where are you? And I told him the story about what happened. I just can't face the online world anymore. It's too scary and it's just hurts so much. I should just go back and get a job. Um, And he said, Pat, dude, I'm so mad at you right now. I was like, oh, now you're mad at me too? Like, why? He said, no, I'm mad at you because every second you waste on this hater is a second that you're taking away from all the people who love your work and who need you and, 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 and want you to show up. And why are you allowing this person to control your life? And that snapped me back into reality. Mm. Um, later, I found out that this person was doing what he was doing because he saw me as an easy, easy target to get more traffic to his website. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. One of my videos on YouTube is about why I quit my $250,000 job as a lawyer. And in it, I talk about how I was so scared of my whole life, I had spent so scared of like what people would think, what my parents would think. And that's why I followed this very traditional path. And one of the comments on it, it was really beautiful. It was saying that the people who judge you and say that you're embarrassing for even trying to go out there to do something different with your life, they're reflecting their own insecurities because they're scared to do it themselves. Mm -hmm. So they don't like seeing you do that. One of my friends said, hurt people hurt people. So whenever I receive one of those kinds of comments now, I try to lead with empathy versus leading with retaliation. And that allows me to wonder at least, well, what is happening in this person's life to do such things? I hope they're okay. Um, And, you know, maybe we can just let it be. But other times I do reach out to them and ask them if everything's okay and eventually find out that they're they're going through tough times and many times they do apologize. Yeah. It's incredible. And and some of those people have become some of my super fans since then because somebody finally was able to sort of just at least be there to listen. I used to do that. I used to get into conversations with people who would leave hateful comments and same thing a lot of times it would end in an apology or like I'm sorry Erica and you see them continue to comment on my videos. But now I'm more concerned about just conserving my energy. And for me right now, I think it always depends on my emotional state too, like how I'm feeling, exposing myself to all of these people on social media. Right now I feel a bit weak. Mm. So right now it's just best for me not even to look at the comments. Sometimes that's best. I mean, I have an assistant who reads my email and I tell her, don't let me see anything that you think would phase me because I need to stay in a positive mood because I want to affect people's lives positively. Um, But there, I can't tell you how many times I've written a comment back, like on YouTube, and I take a breath, and I just delete it. 
like, okay, it's good enough. I got it out there. It's not public. It's like, it reminded me of this video that I saw of Daniel Ratcliffe. I think he was being interviewed and talking about how like a person cut him off when he was driving. He flicked him off, but it was under the window. So nobody could see. <laughs> it was like just for him. <laughs> That's so funny. If people are interested in passive income, what do you think right now is the easiest way to get started? So I call this the uh, five one strategy. All right. Pick one group of people that you want to serve. It could be anybody. Just one group, um, a, a, a target market or a niche, as they might call it. Then go into that group and find one problem that those people have. They're going to have many problems, even if you choose a market like fitness, right? Okay, well, within fitness, there's so many things. And even within the field of, let's say, running, there's so many things that people might need help with. Choosing the right shoes, or if they're going to run ultra marathons, how do you, how do you train for that? If you're going to run your first 5K, it's so different, right? So every subgroup of people has a very specific set of needs and problems and wants, um, a specific language that you should learn about because that's how you can relate and talk about things with them. From there, I would find one person, one person. Try to connect with them in a group or reach out to them. It might be somebody you know already. Help them get one result. And then take that one result and turn it into a testimonial. And when you go through those five things, a number of things happen. Number one, it forces you to choose a group of people to serve, right? When you try to build something that serves everybody, you're actually doing a great job of serving nobody, right? You have to be specific. The riches are in the niches. I know it's pronounced niches, but it rhymes better that way. Um, and when you do that, you also are tasked to, well, how do I find the one person? So you need to kind of get the courage to talk and try to find one. It's better to find one than 10 than 100. Like we sometimes think, oh, we need a business. Okay, we need to find thousands of people. No, just one. Because when you learn about how to reach out to that one person, you'll learn exactly what it takes to reach out to many more. And then helping that one person get a transformation, you're now able to see, well, how might you be able to help them? It's not going to be built on a website even or on, on an online course, you don't need an email list, just trade DMs or get on a chat or text string together to help that person get that result and whatever it takes, because you're going to learn what the roadblocks are, the obstacles, the things that are stopping this person from moving forward that you can help them through, which is now all information that you can use when you start to help more and more people. And then when you get that testimonial, that person saying, oh my gosh, Erica, it was because of you I did this. It unlocks that confidence that you need to get that thing out there. Because that's the biggest thing that most people struggle with. Even if they know they have the best solution, they're not sure if it's working yet. And when you have that sort of even just an ounce of doubt that what it is that you're putting out there in the world might not actually be helpful or is maybe not uh, something that can uh, serve somebody, it comes across in your tone in your videos and your emails. It just doesn't feel as genuine. And, and to you, it, it almost feels slimy because you haven't proven it yet. So when you find that one person and you get that result, and you get that testimonial, which of course you can then use to help market it later, um, oh, the confidence that you have, it almost now feels like your responsibility now to help more, right? If, if the analogy was you have this cure for this disease, wouldn't you not feel the responsibility and obligation to go out there and help cure more people's diseases who have that disease that you have the solution for? It just unlocks a whole new sort of wave of momentum when you reach that point. And that's the easiest way to get started. Um, and then you also might find that, you know, you don't like teaching a person in a certain way, that you prefer to do it um, maybe through email. Cool. You can teach others through that means too because you've learned that about you. Or maybe you do love the one-on-one -on -one and you can do a little bit more consultation. Or maybe you can imagine helping a few people all at once. And then you can do sort of a group cohort style uh, form of teaching. So much is learned by just getting one person, one result. What are the most important lessons around passive income that you yourself have learned through trial and error? You have to start active first. The passive comes from building systems, systems of automation, systems of maybe other people getting on board um, and, and learning how to deliver that solution in, in a way that doesn't require you to always have to be there to do it. Like I remember specifically, and I do got to give credit to where credit's due. A lot of this is a result of Tim Ferriss in his book, The 4-Hour Workweek. I read that when I got laid off and it really helped me set the tone with how I build these businesses. I could have built a architecture study guide business that required me to print all these books and to go to the post office and return them and get you know, all the, the mechanics of that. 
but I removed that part of it. It was all online because I wanted it to be as passive as possible. And then having a website to sort of bring people in to attract people. Um, back then it was through search engine optimization. So I wrote a lot of articles that got really high on search engines and that's how people found me. Uh, people also found me by word of mouth inside of forums and such. So when you create good stuff, people will share it. Um, nowadays, you have the availability of spending money on ads to get in front of the right people and things are so targeted these days. I was talking to somebody the other day who is spending $50,000 a month on TikTok advertising. Wow. Because they're able to get in front of the right people and every month they're making $100,000 more than they're spending because they're getting in front of that targeted audience on that platform. So um, that's how you can sort of start that sequence. But then again, over time, you have to show your expertise. You have to prove that you know what you're talking about and, and then, you know, get them into something. So the big thing, it doesn't happen overnight, right? Um, serve people first. That's always what's most important. The, the easiest way to know what a person might want or need help needs help with is to just talk to them. Right, find that group group of people, and online it's nice because you can have a direct message, and it's not as, it's not like walking up to somebody at Starbucks and going like, "Hey, what do you need help with?" It's like you could find a group where everybody has a similar uh, situation, and then you can go in there and say, "Hey, well, what are your biggest challenges right now? What's the one thing you're struggling with most?" Um, well, let me see if I can help you with that, right? Because I have experience, or I've I've went through it too, and this is what helped me. Um, and then the other thing is maybe it's not even a product that you need to create. Maybe it's one that exists out there in the world already. Oh, you have that problem? I did too. Here's the product I used to help me. I can I can show you how it works. And, and if you want to use it, just here's the link. I get paid. It's at no extra cost to you. And everybody wins. I love marketing where everybody wins, right? And everybody wins in that situation. Um, the other lessons are, you know, listen listen to the people who you've already helped. When you start to have customers come your way already, your best customers are your current customers because they're going to tell you, well, here's what I need next. And so that's something I did with the uh, lead exam stuff is I help people um, study for this exam. And then they started to come to me and say, hey, Pat, I need like I would love practice exams or something um, to be able to, to just know if I'm learning the material or not. And so I listened to that and I said, OK, well, let me create some practice exams for you. But it ended up that there was a company out there called Green Building Education Services that made the best practice exam. And I reached out to them and I said, hey, I'd love to promote your company as sort of a step two to people who buy my book. What do you say? And they said, sure, we'll pay you $22 for every person who comes through. Uh, and it was a $79 product. And this is affiliate marketing at play. So um, the first month I had made $6,000 from just telling everybody who bought my stuff wow. to go here too to supplement that material. And it was like, it almost, it just didn't feel real. It's like, wow, this came out of nowhere. Like it was just out of thin air, it felt like. But it wasn't because I listened to what they needed and I found a solution that was better than one that I could create myself. Yeah. And I just said, well, I know the best way to help you is to go over here. And that company wanted to partner with me. So um, that, was a, that, was, that was my first experience with affiliate marketing. And the fact that like you can help people and get paid too Without having to do any of the customer service or the back end work. Yes. And anybody could, well, most people can sign up to be an affiliate on Amazon through the associates program. Many products that you might use right now are products that might have an affiliate. Target has an affiliate program, Walmart, Home Depot. If you're building things, hey guys, like here are the materials you need to build this really awesome thing that I'm going to show you how to build for free. By the way, if you want to get this material delivered, like here are the links to Home Depot. And then there's, of course, other forms that we passed over earlier of, of gener generating income that's like semi-passive. That's brand deals and sponsorships and that sort of stuff. Um, you still have to do the work to set up those deals. A company will want to pay to get in front of your audience. So that takes a little bit of effort. But then you just need to read a script or talk about the product or have it in the background of your videos. And, you know, they'll pay you for that time. And that's, again, where you have to be very careful because a lot of those deals, especially as you grow, will come your way. Like I'm sure you've had companies reach out to you and say, hey, can you promote our product? And you're like, this does not, this isn't even relevant to my audience. Or it is relevant, but I don't know anything about you. And you have to take care of your people. Because oh, yeah. as soon as you start promoting stuff that doesn't help them or just like is obvious that you're doing it to make money, well, they're not going to take your recommendations anymore and they're going to go elsewhere. Yeah. Um, so, so those are big lessons. Uh, you know, listen to your audience. Um, and, and continue to find out how to further serve your audience once once they've kind of come into your environment.
I recently turned down a $100,000 deal because it was a financial services product that I just didn't feel like my audience would benefit from and I didn't feel comfortable like sharing it with my audience because to me that tr- it's tough to say no to $100,000. Let's get that straight, but I would never want to promote anything that I don't 100% believe in that I wouldn't give to my dad and my sister and my mom. And so you just have to make those tough decisions when you have an audience that trusts you. And usually what happens when you do that is you turn down that $100,000 deal, months go by and an awesome company comes by and says, hey, we'll give you 150 k right? Like <laughs> those opportunities will keep coming so long as you keep showing up. And I think that's the big thing is like, especially today, if you have a personal brand um, or you are a creator and you're creating content that people consume on a regular basis, I mean, if you stop creating, it starts to slow down. Like it just, it's just naturally going to be that way. So is there really even such thing as passive income? Like full on forever? Pass- no, I actually don't think so. But you can build things in a way that when you put the hard work up front, they can continue to pay you again and again over time so that you can go on Disneyland on a Tuesday when there's less traffic because you can. And that's like what has been the biggest benefit for me and my family is we have, as you often say, that freedom and that uh, flexibility with with time. That's really what we're doing here. We're, we're, we're able to now bend time with the flexibility and the passive income, residual income that we earn. What we're only tied down to now is like the kids' school schedule. <laughs> Other than that, we could do whatever, whenever, right? I'm usually the, like I go to Target to shop. There's one buyer house. When I go in there after I drop the kids off at school, it's like new moms. That's the only people who I see in in Target at that hour. And I could park right up front because everybody's at work. And it's just, I feel so blessed to be in that situation. I've even had teachers come because my wife and I both pick up our kids every day. Um, Teachers come to us and say, you're the only pair that always come in. Like, how are you able to do, like, did you win the lottery or something? I'm like, no, even better, right? I, I worked hard and earned this freedom. Mm-hmm. It's taken time, but it's allowed us for this flexibility to be there with the kids or you know, go to Target. Yeah. One of the things I like about the passive income, though, is I always say that you have to either have time or money to get started. And it sounds like for both of us, we had time on our hands, not really money. And if you have time on your hands, building an audience seems like the path to go. I mean, that's what we both found success with. And it's not an overnight success. For YouTube, when I started posting videos on YouTube, it took me one video a week um, for six months, I believe, to hit 2,000 subscribers, which was just enough to be able to make maybe about $1,000 a month from it. So what it didn't quite cover my living expenses at that point. But then you build on that. Then you have that one viral video that will help you out. Yeah. But that's what I really like is that it is, I think anyone can can do this. I agree. I agree with that. Um, but not everyone will. Mm-hmm. And then usually it's a result of what's the conversation we're all having with ourselves up here. And there were so many moments, even after I became successful and started making money, that I just continued to doubt myself. Um, there's a really good book by a man named Stephen Pressfield called The War of Art. And it speaks to this idea that uh, we as creatives, entrepreneurs, musicians, wh- whatever creative you are, um, the bigger you try to do something, the bigger the shadow that's ca- that it's casting and the harder it is to get through that. And we often self-sabotage through procrastination or self-doubt um, by putting ourselves in a situation to fail because we just expect it to happen. But there are some things that you can do to stack things in your favor, right? You could you could learn from others who have already made those mistakes. You can invest in that education to um, go out there and figure out a way to do something. Um, you know, I like to say, find somebody who is a year, two years, three years ahead of you. And if, if that's where you wanna be, learn from them, right? Whether you can learn from them directly or virtually. Um, there's a person who's a big inspiration to me. His name is Michael Hyatt. He's like a leader of leaders. And for the longest time, I never met him but he was my mentor virtually because I read his books and I just, he was with his family the way that I wanted to be with my family. And he and I now have since uh, bonded and have become friends and have gone fly fishing together. It's, it's really amazing. Um, but he still continues to set that example and I still continue to 
learn from him and ask him questions and have him guide me. Um, you can have colleagues and friends around you who understand what you're shooting for. Um, there is a very popular term in the entrepreneurial space and just in general called a mastermind group. And in a mastermind group, um, which might be anywhere between two people to uh, 10 or even more, I think five is the sweet spot. Um, essentially, it's a formal, in my case, weekly meeting where we get together. These are different entrepreneurs in different niches. I actually prefer it that way because you can cross pollinate and learn a lot of things from somebody else doing something completely different. Uh, and then every week, one person is in the hot seat. And in the hot seat, you talk about what you're working on, what you're struggling with, one challenge, and the rest of the people there are focused on you. And it's just a beautiful hour where, I mean, with all those brains helping you, thinking things through, it's very difficult to do this alone because you can't read the label when you're inside the bottle. You have to have other people to be able to not just kind of give you like, you got this, you got this, slay, you're, you're awesome. Like, that's great to have that motivation. And we get that from friends and family. But you need people to also say, hey, I don't think that's right for you. Or that didn't really sit well with me. Here, let's talk about it, right? And to do that in an honest, safe space is so key. There's been so many times where I've needed somebody to go, uh, to kind of like slap me out of a certain situation and go, Pat, I don't think you should promote that because it doesn't represent your brand the way I think you think you it does. Yeah. And then I'm like, well, let's talk about that because I thought it was. And now I can get the outside perspective, which is likely what the rest of the audience is thinking. And I could get, you know, I can come back to the, to the light side. So having like a brain trust, if you will, um, is really important, I think. And you can just get started with one other person and build from there. Yeah. What's your next book on? So the book is about learning. Uh, that's like the the overarching theme. But it's about, it's it's actually tentatively called the lean learner. Um, there's like the lean startup. startup yeah. There's this lean learner. And the reason it's called that is because I think we're at a point in time now where we all, and I think we all know this, we're all suffering from content bloat. We are having so much information coming our way that we're just getting stuffed and we're we're hoarding it. And as a result of that, we're not taking the time to actually execute on anything and apply it. So how do we filter that learning and take in what matters and keep out what doesn't? It's very difficult to say no to learning. But when you say no to learning one thing, you're saying yes to going deeper into something that you care about or passionate about. Or, you know, it's, it's like back in the day, you were the genius when you could answer every Jeopardy question right? Oh my gosh, he's so smart. Like you should be on Jeopardy. Like that's what was praised. That, that's what was rewarded. Now it's not about having all the information anymore. In fact, a Google search is accessible to everybody. So it's not about getting access to the information. There's so much of it. It's how do we find the right information, the right time? And so this book will take a person through that. And, and, and how do we manage our time with relation to learning and doing? Um, there's a strategy in the book that I've practiced for the last almost decade now called the 20% itch rule. And this isn't new. This is just what I've called it. But a lot of companies even practice this. And that is 80% of your time dedicated to the thing that you are committed to, right? If you are an entrepreneur, it's 80% of your time to your business and your work. If you are an employee, it's 80% of your time. Google does this. 80% of their employees work or 80% uh, of their employees time are for things that is in their job description. 20% of the time is for experiment, for play. And so in my life, 80% of my time is dedicated to my team and SPI and things that I have responsibilities for and whatnot. 20% of time is for experimentation and play and choosing one thing to go into that time to just to see what happens. A few years ago, I used the 20% of my time to invent something. I've never done physical product before, but I now had space to play and do it such that even if it were to fail, it would still be a lesson at least and something I could share and help others with. But we, my uh, videographer and I, we were actually at Vid Summit in 2018. And there we um, discovered that there was a need for a very sturdy tripod to hold in a person's hand. So we invented the Switch Pod. And the Switch Pod is now sold tens of thousands of, of those and through Amazon and our website. And it's become this now mostly passive business because somebody else is helping with the fulfillment and it's all mostly automated. Um, and that's really amazing because a physical product, you know, when people get it in their hands, it's already, it's like, oh my gosh, I could use this now. And yeah. just to see, like I've seen people in the wild use it. It's so amazing. It's so fun. Recently, 
starting at the end of 2020, early 2021, my 20% of time was now dedicated to a new YouTube channel in the Pokemon space. And this channel is called Deep Pocket Monster. And I've gone deep on it because <laughs> in a year and a half, it has now 300,000 subscribers. It's making more money than my entrepreneurial channel. And there are brand deals, Pokemon sending me stuff before anybody else now because they see me as an influencer. It's pretty crazy. Wow. And it's because I've focused, like, first of all, it's my play. But I've I, be, because I'm not trying 100 things, I'm trying one thing and I want to learn everything there is about it. I can go deeper into it. So I can build relationships with people in that space. I can study it. I can, um, you know, I can just understand it more that way. So this Pokemon thing is becoming a real thing. And I'm holding my first event for the Pokemon community in Los Angeles or in Anaheim in 2023. Um, and I'm hoping to have like three to 5,000 people there. What? It's kind of insane. <laughs> And what does a Pokemon influencer make? And then what does a Pokemon card cost? The cards range. I mean, there are common cards that are worth pennies all the way up to um, the authenticated graded old cards that are very rare that um, one of them sold for a half million dollars. Recently, there was another one that sold an auction for 2.2 million. Uh, it's kind of, it, it's all over the place. And there's, in, even in the Pokemon space, there's sub niches. There's people who collect for the investment side of it. There's people who play the game. There's people who collect the art. There's so many sub niches within it. Um, and I bring sort of a entertainment spin into it, right? I create these stories around the cards and have fun YouTube videos that have challenges and kind of <laughs> Mr. B style giveaways and things like that. But the influencer in the Pokemon space, what will they make? It's It differs. Um, and I'm usually up front with all my money anyway, so I'm going to tell you. Um, over the past 28 days, well, we've had some videos pop on YouTube, which is always a good thing. I know you've had some of those too. Uh, we had a video that saw a million views in six days. Wow. Which was awesome. And it was cool because my kids were in it and stuff. Um, anyway, that helped a lot because now the whole channel is surging. But in the last 28 days, we're at $41,000 in ad revenue. Oh my goodness. Just from YouTube. From Pokemon. Like I'm a grown man playing with cardboard with cartoons on them, but because it's speaking to that audience and it's not kids, it's people my age who grew up with Pokemon yeah. who now have money to spend on it, which is really interesting. That's that's the biggest part of the, the audience. My last 28 days YouTube ad revenue, would you like to guess? <laughs> oh no, I don't want to guess. <laughs> it's $4,000, but I haven't posted a long form YouTube video in months. You've been doing shorts, a lot yeah. of shorts I've noticed. But shorts don't make any money. Not yet. Not yet. They just made that announcement, so. We'll see. Yeah. Fingers crossed. Yeah. <laughs> now that, do you enjoy doing the shorts? I love the shorts. I think I'm a better short form creator than I am a long form creator. Why do you say that? I just enjoy it more. I'm more of a succinct person. So being able to condense information into 30 seconds and figure out how I can most effectively convey what I want to convey, that challenge is fun for me. And then the audience also tells you what you're better at, right? But I mean, your one of your most popular videos is a very long video and a story. How would it feel if that video were only 60 seconds? It wouldn't be enough to convey the message behind that one, which is, I think you're referring to the one I about why I quit my job. Yeah, it was a great story. That would be hard to do in 60 seconds. <laughs> you'd, you'd get a very abbreviated version. Yeah. It, I don't think it would have as big of an impact either. So I think there's room for both for, for creators. But it is a very weird thing on YouTube right now because some people are saying shorts kind of stunt the growth of long videos or vice versa? Should they be separate channels? It's kind of up in the air right now. It's so up in the air and you just have to give it your best guess and go with what you feel is best. Yeah. No one knows. I mean, everyone says they're a YouTube algorithm expert, but no one really knows. No, just the, the guy who writes the algorithm is the algorithm expert. <laughs> but there is no guy who writes the algorithm. That's the point. <laughs> well, there actually is a guy who controls the algorithm. Really? Yeah. I'm Actually? In, I'm in a Discord with him and a few other YouTubers. Oh. And he's his name is The Algorithm in there. Are you allowed to be saying this? Are we gonna get Probably. I don't know. I've heard other people talk about it. So What? Okay, tell me more. Uh so a friend of mine invited me into this group and this Discord has some just I I don't want to start mentioning a bunch of names, but like the top YouTubers in it. And it's really amazing because they're honest conversations about the platform that ultimately help everybody. And I love that. Um, these people in the YouTube space with a big voice 
and a big audience can say what they like or dislike about certain changes that YouTube's making. And then YouTube has direct access to these creators to say, hey, what do you guys think? Right. So I'm just very grateful to just kind of watch from the sidelines because I'm sort of a little fish in there. Um, and it's just amazing how, what those people have done with their ba- brands and businesses. But I do try to provide value when I can. Like there was a podcasting conversation that happened. I was like, "Ooh, I have something to say here. <laughs> <laughs> provide value. Um, so, yeah, I'm, I'm grateful to be in. Again, a lot of this is who, you know, and, and who can you connect with? And I try to be the dumbest person in the room always because I can learn so much, so much faster. And I used to be the opposite. I was like, I want to be the smart person who teaches everybody and like everybody claps for me. Okay, like what value does that provide me? I mean, as an Enneagram three, maybe a little bit of just self-esteem. But other than that, like I'm not able to help people if I'm the smartest person in the room. Well, unless it's like a conference and I'm trying to help people learn something. (laughs) But you know what I mean? Like as far as growth and and scalability and whatnot but i feel like there's also more it's more challenging when you're not the smartest person in the room because there's so much room to learn like for me i've been through my phases i did the ebooks and i feel like i know enough about ebooks and rugby and rugby so i got bored with that and moved (laughs) on (laughs) i did the youtube thing i've done the tiktok thing and now it's like okay what do i create next i want to create a podcast and it's been so fun for me to start with the podcast not even understand like what a podcast hosting platform is and try to figure out all of these different things it gives me the spark of going from zero to one which i enjoy zero to one journey versus one to two journey yeah i mean it's zero to one on podcasting but it's one to two as far as your overall audience, right? You're, you're adding another element that they can now go deeper with you on. And I love that you're doing a podcast because podcasting changed my life when I started mine. It's the number one way people found out about me. It's the number one way we promote things and sell things. It's the number one way I've been able to build connections just like you and I are becoming friends today. So I just, I love the platform and it's just with the behavior of the listener, for those of you listening to this right now, you might be on a walk or on a run or commuting shouldn't be watching videos when you're doing those things necessarily. So we're able to get into a different part of your life. And many people who are listeners of podcasts build a ritual or a habit around listening to you. So I love that you're doing it. I think it's a really smart move. And I'm curious to see, I think you said that I'm the second to last in at least the season for you for this podcast tour that you've been doing. I'm not doing seasons, but I'm doing one a week per for a year, no matter what, as with everything I do. And so it's just the last of this recording batch. Oh, okay. I'll have to figure out how to record the rest of the 52. Oh, got it. Got <laughs> it. Okay. Well, I hope that, uh, I hope like if you need help, let me know. What po- advice do you have for me? For podcasting? Be genuinely curious. As an interviewer, that's the best thing you can do. Because people always ask me, what questions should I ask? Right? Or how do I get a good story out of somebody? Because it's really all about stories. Just be genuinely curious. When you're curious, you ask the right questions that your audience is also thinking about. And then you can get excited about the parts that are being spoken about. Uh, what happened next? Well, then what, right? Like that kind of stuff. The podcasts that are like question, answer, question, answer. It's like, well, then you don't even need to be the host. <laughs> you know, <laughs> anybody could be the host at that point. So be genuinely curious. And if you do want a story from somebody, the best way to do this would be, I think it was Alex Bloomberg who, who said this at a conference once. He said, cue up your interviewee like this. Um, Tell me about a time when blank. And then you just sit back and listen because you've now given this person permission to tell the story. And then oftentimes the person in the interview seat will stop because I don't want to be rude and take over. But if it hasn't gotten to that point that you want it to go to yet, you can just say, no, keep going. Or what will happen next? And then I go, oh, you want me to go? Okay, I'll keep going. (laughs) Right. Uh, So those are just some interview tips. And then as far as like getting it out there. Um, the biggest thing for me, the biggest realization for me was that actually social media does not grow the podcast as much as we want it to, right? We think that when we repurpose it and put it on a platform, people are going to see a little micro clip of it and then come over to the podcast and subscribe. Very difficult to do that. There's a lot of friction in podcasting to go and subscribe, especially from social media. That's not why they're there. But these little clips can be very important because it's a way for little bits of your podcast to at least still get in front of them and for you to still show up where they are, right? You should still ask them to subscribe, but it's not gonna grow the podcast as much as you being on other podcasts or better yet, creating content that just cannot help but be spoken about and shared at the water cooler or shared at the dinner table, right? It's why we all 
fell in love with Serial because it was just this incredible story that even recently now, the main protagonist, Ad, Ad, Ahmed or Adman, he's free now because of the Serial podcast. Did you hear about this? No, oh, sorry. So there's, do you know what's the podcast Serial? No. It like put podcasting on the mainstream. So there was a podcast in 2012, 2013 that a woman created that essentially talked about this real life case where a person went to jail for a crime that wasn't necessarily like proven that he did it, but he still went to jail. And so she pulled out all this information and documentation and like brought the story back. And actually because of that, he was in the spotlight and they re-looked at his case. And just like last week, he's, he's a free man now because there wasn't enough evidence really, but it was just, it would, wasn't done right back then. Wow. Which is crazy. Like, that's the impact that a podcast can have when there is that kind of story to tell. It just spread through the dinner table and naturally out there. And then it even, it even helped the person who was in jail for 30 years wow. be free. That's wild. It's super wild. And I remember around that time of Serial, there was like an SNL spoof of it. I was like, wow, they're like actually like podcasting is going mainstream. And it was at, it was in 2013 and 2014 when Serial was huge. I think I'm getting my years right that I saw a spike in my podcast because here's what happens. People were like, podcast, what's that? I know oh, the story. Okay, I'll listen to it. Fine, I'll subscribe. Whoa, there's all these other shows I can download and it's free. Like, let me search up online business or, you know, entrepreneurship or something. And then they found my show. So the beauty of podcasting is people don't replace the shows they're listening to with yours. They just add to that playlist usually. And if you talk to most people, on average, they're subscribed to seven or eight different shows. So you don't have to compete with other podcasters. You just have to compete with attention and time and story. So get great stories, tell great stories, and um, you know naturally it'll continue to grow. What was it about podcasting that drew you in? Because you started your podcast years ago before it yeah, became 2010. So, <laughs> wow, before it became so mainstream. It was because the Internet Business Mastery podcast, which started a couple of years before, changed my life. It was listening to that show on the train every day where I became friends with Jeremy and Jason, even though I never knew them or met them. I eventually did. But it was hearing their voice and their reassurance and their education that inspired me to one day create a podcast. Now, I said in December of 2008, once I created Smart Passive Income, that I was going to create a podcast. I bought all the, the equipment. I spent hundreds of dollars on like the microphone and all the stuff. December of 08, that's how much I wanted to start a podcast. My first episode didn't come out until July of 2010 because I was so scared oh my of what people would say and all the stuff that we talked about earlier about uh, how other people might dislike what you're doing or think you're crazy or weird or the sound of my voice. I didn't like it. And I only wish I started sooner. I mean, I started early, but I could have started much earlier. And much like compounding interest, right? The earlier you get started, the more time there is for things to begin having that exponential growth. Yeah. Do you have an exit strategy? I know we talked before about a lot of the passive income streams that you build when you're a content creator rely on you consistently putting out new content. And if you stop doing that, eventually the audience inflow will kind of die down. Yeah, there's opportunities to sell what you build. You know, I've had friends who've built software and then that creates passive income opportunities, but then a company comes in and says, hey, we'll pay you millions of dollars to own it and then, okay, cool. And then now you can take that money and invest it somewhere else or follow some of your advice uh, as far as where you might be able to put it. Um, but do I have an exit strategy? Long-term, yeah. I would love to, and uh, you know, you're already on Smart Passive Income, you're seeing less and less of me because it's not about me anymore. It's about the team and the community. We're a community-based um, media company now. And so it's not even about me, which then offers the opportunity for me to step away even further if I wanted to, right, where I can just remain maybe an advisor to the company or even sell it off and the audience and the team would still be taken care of. Um, and then over time, I'd love to do more advisorship. Um, I'm an advisor to seven different companies right now where we chat once a month and we just have honest conversations about the growth of the business and I can offer my advice. And those are uh, big um interesting money-making opportunities because I own shares of those companies now. And when those companies either go public or they get acquired, you know, I being a shareholder will see a large check when that happens. And, you know, to know that I've had an influence to help the company not just make money so I can make money, but 
so that everybody else can sort of enjoy that celebration uh, is is really cool and exciting. Yeah. Um, so I do have more plans for that, and and you know, it's but as far as like oh, I'm going to sell the company, that's not it. That's not like really in the books right now. Although that could change. Who knows? But. Um, all I know is I'm going to continue to to try to like you make an impact uh, in in the way that I can, and I feel like this is SPI. Although it's a big stone, it's it, it's a stepping stone to something new. What is the most meaningful feedback someone from your audience could possibly give you? So, if you're a content creator of any kind, the best comment you could ever receive is, "I feel like you made this just for me." It's literally the best thing anybody could ever say because that means you nailed it. You nailed the message. You mailed the tone and the language, and you got that messaging and positioning right. And 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 as Jay Abraham says, if you can define the problem better than your target customer, they're going to automatically assume you have the solution. So the way to sell your product is to not ram it down a person's throat. It's to listen and to understand how might I be able to connect this with you and how might it serve you. It might not even serve them ultimately in which case you need to go back or find a different group of people. But um, that is the best. I, I love when I hear that. I feel like you're speaking directly to me. It's the best. Yeah. I'm sure you get that too. I Actually, I read some comments on your channel, um, people hearing your story and saying like this, like there was a person who dedicated their whole life to the medical field. And it was like, I just felt every word and everything you were saying, right? Do you agree that that's like one of the best things you can hear? Yeah, yeah. For me... I think my story of quitting, the fact that it resonates with people makes me really happy because I remember how scared I was in that decision. And when I was making that decision, I wished there would have been more people from my industry who had YouTube videos about why they quit. Because then I would know I'm not alone in the feeling of, is this what I want to do with the rest of my life? Right. Um, so that's really impactful. And then now I really love when it's about money. Like Erica, one of your TikToks saved me five thousand dollars yeah. or whatever it is yeah i mean that that's great too like to see literally the impact that you're making it's it's there's nothing like it yeah um fun fact there is a very big pokemon youtuber named leonhart he was a former lawyer and he quit his job to do pokemon wow to do what he was to do what he loved i gotta so like look it, into this pokemon thing <laughs> <laughs> You take anything away from this podcast, uh, Pokemon. <laughs> Pokemon influencer, I can make forty one thousand. No, like that's Pat no, Flynn. that's not. <laughs> again, I a lot of people see that and they're like, "You just started this YouTube channel and you're already this successful with it, like overnight success." No, I've been on YouTube since two thousand and nine. I've made every mistake for over a decade until in year eleven, or twelve, I created this new channel. So no, this is not. This is twelve years of learning and mistakes and then putting this into place. Do you think any of your existing audience transferred over to the Pokemon channel or it was mostly organic growth within YouTube? It was mostly organic growth within YouTube. Wow. Yeah. Um, my audience, yeah, some of them are just interested in anything that I do, but we can see the growth on YouTube coming from suggested and browse because, and it did, it, it did work in my favor that in 2020 during the pandemic, collectibles just blew up because people had money and were wanting to, you know, relive nostalgia and whatnot. So that is how I got into it was in that wave. And then being so involved in that space, attending other people's live streams, becoming moderators for different groups. I was just like, wow, there's, there's, a, there's something missing here. I think I could create it. My latest thing that I'm into now is bass fishing. So this is me going back to what my dad and I used to do as, as when I was a kid. Fishing, it's part of who I am, but I hadn't done it in a while. And in April this year of 2022, I went back to a lake just to kind of fish and see what it was like. And I just was like, wow, to be out in nature again, to put the devices down is just like amazing. And I'm trying really hard, Erica, to not create a YouTube channel about it <laughs> so that I can just like, just enjoy it. You know, not that yeah, I don't enjoy resist, the, resist. You know, you I'm don't sure. want cameras around you for that. No, but I'm like, I could just put the chest cam on and still have the two hands to go fishing. And <laughs> I'm just I'm watching all these other YouTubers and I'm like, oh, I would do it this way instead. And I, maybe I should start a channel. Uh, no, I'm not going to do it yet. But somebody may resurface this later uh, <laughs> when I do eventually have one. So we'll see. One of the my favorite images is going back to what you were talking about, how 
people think you're an overnight success because of the Pokemon channel, but what they don't see is all the years you've been on YouTube before that. It's this image of this iceberg where you only see the top above the water, but you don't see all of the built up ice underneath. Yeah. And it's like people only see that success right after you've made it up off the top of the water. If you ask any successful creator, entrepreneur, like really what did it take to get here? You're going to see a giant block of ice underneath that surface, right? That's that's that phrase tip of the iceberg is that's what you're talking about. Yeah. And there's always so much more behind it. Even TikTok, I feel like people I did start TikTok less than a year ago, gained 17 million followers in less than a year. That's awesome. But I was on YouTube two years before that and learning how to create good hooks, how to be better on camera because I'm very shy in front of a camera. I still I'm sweating right now because I get very nervous in front of cameras. <laughs> you probably need to actually. <laughs> But it, it took a few years of being on YouTube to be able to find the confidence to go on TikTok and understand how to craft a video in a way that I could have better audience retention. I think it was MKBHD. I interviewed him as a prominent YouTube tech uh, reviewer, right? Uh, and he told me during the interview that his first 100 videos were for his first 100 subscribers. And when I heard that, I was like, oh, everybody needs to hear this. Because we think we can just be MKBHD overnight. But it took him years, Mr. Beast. His first 200 videos were for his first 100 subscribers. They were like crappy Minecraft videos. And look at him now. And he's over 100 million, which is amazing. Did you see he just turned on a billion dollar offer? Did he? Yeah. For what? For his brand and everything surrounding it. Oh, he would never take that. I know. Never. <laughs> but it's still crazy that. Billion dollars. A billion dollars. I think his his burgers are going to make a billion dollars. His he burgers. already said they have crossed a hundred million. Yeah, it'll it'll happen. And that was months ago. So he's well on his way to that. I ordered Beast Burgers, Mr. Beast. If you're watching this, uh, he's not. He has no idea who I am. <laughs> <laughs> Don't say that. Um, for, on the first day it came out, and my kids and I were so excited, and it took five hours to get DoorDashed because it was so popular. Wow. Which part of me was like, oh my gosh, I'm so hungry. Like. We basically had dinner when we ordered lunch, but another part of me was, "Whoa, this this is going to go big." Was it good? It was all right. <laughs> I'm an I'm an In and Out fan. Oh, I love In and Out. Good. We might have lost half the viewers just now, but um, why? Because there's this huge like In and Outs like versus five versus guys. Five Guys or you know what's the other one? Um, Shake Shack. In and Out is really good. Every time I come to the West Coast, that's one of my first stops. Must be. It must. Yeah. What do you get? Animal style, of course. And you get animal the, style fries? Yes. Animal style fries, plus for the fries, extra crispy. Ooh. Have you ever done that? I haven't done extra crispy, yeah. but I always get animal style fries. So good. So good. <laughs> With all of the different things you have going on, how do you think about goals and how you want to spend the next year or two years or five years? It's a great question. I had mentioned earlier, like when I got laid off, my goal is just to survive. And then it became thrive. And then it became a lot of philanthropic uh, goals uh, beyond that. And now like even bigger investments and impact and whatnot. And I think it it always happens that way in phases, right? You have to change. And that, that means you have to kind of check in with yourself every once in a while. Um, the biggest thing I did up front, and I talk about this in my book, Will It Fly? In fact, there's an exercise that I'd love to share that anybody can do um, sort of right now if they wanted to. And it's called the, the airport test. Um, I learned this from a uh, author named Jay Papasan, the author of The One Thing. He does this. He works with Keller Williams Realty. And they do this when they have employees come in and see if they can get hired or not. They run this test. So if you imagine that you are five years into the future, right? You take the DeLorean, you're five years into the future, and you're at an airport. And you're kind of sitting at the gate waiting for your next flight. And then you feel a tap on your shoulder. Tap, tap, tap. And you look back and, oh my gosh, it's your friend that you haven't seen in like so long. And you both have time to kill. So you go into the lounge and you're just having a chat and catching up. And this person, this friend of yours from a while back that you haven't seen in a while, they ask you, so Erica, like how, how are you? How are things going in your life right now? And you respond, life is awesome. Like I couldn't imagine it any better right now. With that in mind, Five years from now, the things that support you being able to say that, you take a piece of paper, you fold it into four quadrants, and you pick four areas of your life that are most important to you. 
and you create a header on each quadrant with those four things. So for me, it might be family, finances, uh, health, and play, for example. Uh, for you, it might be music or it might be something else, right? Those four things. And then in each of those quadrants, spend time writing the things that are happening in your life five years from now that support that life is awesome. What this does, this is not a wish list, by the way. I hope this happens. Like this is happening in your life five years from now to tell a person that you haven't seen in a while that life is awesome. When you finish this piece of paper, this becomes your guide for what to say yes to or what to say no to. If you are presented with an opportunity, does it actually fit the family goals that you have or the financial goals that you have? There was a opportunity I had in 2016 to become the CEO of a hosting company, the billion dollar hosting company. It would have meant tens of millions of dollars in my pocket, um, very prestigious sort of office level job and just travel. But when I look at my paper, it's obvious that this is a no because I wouldn't be able to take my kids to school every day anymore, right? Immediately, I can just say no and be okay with it. This is an awesome life, but it's not my awesome life. Maybe somebody else can have it. So this is how I check in with myself every year. I, I rewrite this thing at the start of every year. My wife and I both do it so that we could see what her goals are. And I can understand that and vice versa. We can see what we have in alignment. We could see what might need to be discussed because if I want to, you know, live in, on a lake house, but she wants to live in a beach house, well, we're going to have to eventually talk about that. <laughs> Let's talk about it now before it becomes an issue. So that's how I recommend. I mean, it's important to think about the future. And I think, you know, Five years into the future is just long enough where, you know, we don't necessarily know what's going to happen, but it's it's close enough to know that you can get there. Um, and I think because, you know, things like technology and platforms are changing so fast, having these rules for your life and, you know, understanding the other important people around you as well. Um, I mean, you can't help but at least know you're headed in the right direction with the decisions that you make. That's so interesting. So what what is on your actual paper? What are you most excited about in the next five years to be focusing on? Let's go through the categories, right? Uh, health and fitness will likely remain the same. It's a semi-strict diet where I can just continue to have the energy that I want to have to be able to um, be with my kids in their last five to eight summers that I have with them to um, having enough creative energy to continue to do what I'm doing online to just longevity, right? Uh, so that takes care of that category, really. Uh, with family, it really involves a lot of experiences, different experiences that we want to have together as a family. We want to go to Japan. We have not been to Japan. And now that I'm into Pokemon, this might actually be a very dangerous thing because I will come back with lots of things. But we, we want to have these experiences that the kids can take with them into adulthood that they'll remember and pass on to their kids and, and whatnot. Uh, if they choose to have kids. Um, we want to go to Europe. We want to go back to Australia and just, we were, we don't have much time left with them. So a lot of the family goals are related to, to those kinds of situations. Um, a lot of the family stuff, especially now as the kids are becoming teenagers are related to our relationship with them. Uh, you know, five years from now, what would be awesome if my son was going through a tough time and he could come to me and just talk honestly about it, right? So now when it comes to the way that I discipline or the way that April and I both discipline, April's my wife, how would it reflect that five years from now? How did the decisions we make now as far as how we parent help support that we want to have those honest conversations with our kids? It's not just my son, it's my son and my daughter um, down the road, right? So you can see how like even thinking about that now helps us make decisions today, um, helps, us, helps us guide that direction. Um, we are thinking about the kids' future as far as, you know, whether it's college or, or not and, you know, their education, things like that. Um, with relation to finances, I, I think five years from now, I am beyond SPI. It's still running. I'm still advising. I'm still a part of it. Maybe I'm just still the podcast host, but it's being completely run by others to help serve even more people. Um, and that allows me to then focus more on some 
advisory roles, uh, 10 companies in total at that time. I'm almost there already, but that's max, I think, uh, as well as perhaps a new company in the fintech or software space that my partner and I have been discussing for a long time, but just hadn't had the time for, which is why we're making room for it now. Um, I do want to have an impact in the world of education in some way and get on very large stages to talk about a lot of the things that I've learned that I can pass on to educators as far as where I think we are today with the world of education and how archaic it still is. We need to make some changes quickly for how quickly things are changing. And then, you know, little things like I still want to go on date nights every night with my wife or every week, at least every night would be cool, but maybe that's, maybe she wouldn't <laughs> like it that often. Uh, but once a week, you know, things like those kinds of things um, are important to me. So you'll notice that there's no mention of, you know, Lamborghinis or huge mansions, which is, that's me. If that's on your list, that's cool too. Then what's awesome is you can make decisions now to help you get there. Um, it's where we are working just because we're working. It's when we're working just to stay busy. It's when we're working without a goal in mind that we just end up losing energy and burning out or just being unhappy. It's like driving around a car with no destination in mind. Um, you're eventually going to lose gas and get stranded. So know what your goals are so that you can at least go in that direction. And if you get off direction, you can have, you know, your version of a, of a navigation system, i.e. a mastermind group, other people around you to say, hey, you need to make a U-turn because <laughs> you're going down the wrong direction. And we know this is where you want to go. So even though I'm surprised because you talk about money and smart passive income all day, every day, you don't have money goals or you don't have like a certain benchmark that you're targeting or. It's a lifestyle target. It's not a money target, which I know those two things are related because you need a certain number of dollars to live a certain lifestyle. But we we very much live currently below our means. And, you know, we we have a lot of money in reserves and from emergent, like we've taken care of those things, you know, and, and I don't talk about this very much as far as like, well, okay, I make all this money. Where does it go? I mean, I have several investments. I am an angel investor. I have everything from an emergency fund to, you know, SEP IRAs, like all the things they're all, it's all taken care of. So why do I need more money? Right. I can just invest that money into people, into team to buy me more time, mm -hmm. or I can just donate that money. And that's what we've been doing. So knowing what everything that you know about passive income and everything that you've learned, if you were to start over today, no audience, no podcast, nothing, and your sole objective was to make the most amount of passive income possible, what would you do? I would pick a audience that I would love to help. I mean, it's it's essentially the the five one strategy, right? But in addition to that, I would pick one platform to show up on, probably YouTube or a podcast right now, to provide value, to show up, to answer questions, to become that expert, and then again, find that one person to help. Do it manually first, and then the next time around, do it in a more automated fashion. Maybe through a course that you build, or maybe you hire a coach to teach your ways to somebody else, so that way it's not you this time. Um, or it's a product that already exists that I can promote as an affiliate. Again, I, the answer to how do I make money is always going to be, well, how do you serve people best? Mm. That's always going to, that's the secret. What do people need help with? Help them do that. Make money. That's it. <laughs> we don't need to overcomplicate it, right? Well, how many yeah. emails do I need? Like that stuff is all byproduct of you stepping up to help people. So figure out what they need help with, remove the guesswork as much as possible, and then help them. And then you can get into, well, what are the different ways that I can help them now? How might I begin to make this more passive? How might I do something now that just continues to work for me later? That, all, that will just come naturally, but you have to help people first. You've obviously had to build a team around you to do this. How do you think about what you want to outsource and then also make sure that your time isn't spent just managing a team versus doing the thing? I've met a lot of entrepreneurs who have hired people to take time back only to spend more time managing those people, right? So this is a great question. For me, I didn't start hiring people till seven years into my journey because selfishly, I was like, nobody could do it like me. 
not true. People could do it way better than me, like editing my podcast and putting things out there, um, representing the brand. I, I, I was just, there was so much pride in, oh, I'm going to do all of it. And I was almost burnt out because of that. Um, I got very, very, very used to the idea that, wow, I can find people who actually enjoy these things that I hate doing. That's the other part of it. I didn't believe that people would love spreadsheets or getting into the editor or whatever. There are people who love that, like work with them because they would not dare do what you do and you can work together with them. Uh, there are a couple of resources to help a person get started with something like that. Um, the first book would be my, one of my best friends. He wrote a book called Virtual Freedom. And it really helps you expand on the, on the idea of, well, what exactly should you hand off and what, what should you keep? Um, and working with even just part-time virtual assistants first before you actually bring people on board as like a, a W-2. Um, beyond that, there's another book that's really good, especially if you're growing a bigger brand. Um, and this would be great, I think, for someone in your position. Uh, it's called Rocket Fuel. And this book talks about the dichotomy between a visionary, like an entrepreneur who has like big visions, big goals, and then the other person that they need, their other half, the integrator, the person who can actually like plan and execute that big vision or to say, we don't have the resources to do that right now. Or, hey, we need to hire people in order to do that. That person in my life is my friend, Matt Gartland, who initially I hired his company and then I just acquired it because he was doing such good work. And then he's now since become CEO of SPI Media. Wow. So he's CEO because he is the operations integrator person and I am the founder creator, um, the person like... If you're watching a newscast, I'm the person you're seeing on screen. But Matt is in my ear. And there's a whole back room behind that's like doing most of the work, <laughs> right? So having a person like that has been so key. And again, he just loves that kind of stuff. And I'm so grateful I don't have to do it. <laughs> yeah. Because then I can do the things that I want to do and things that I'm good at. And, you know, when you're starting a business, you do have to wear all the hats, especially if you're bootstrapping. But over time, you can start handing off the hats that maybe don't excite you as much. And then the hardest thing, as my buddy Chris talks about in his book, is handing off the things that you're good at, that you actually love to do, but maybe you just shouldn't do it. That's where you get the most time back, but it's also the hardest to let go. I'm having the hardest struggle right now balancing burnout with my desire to make an impact. I think that social media is so unique where a lot of us have a shorter amount of time to be quite relevant and getting lots of views across platforms. And so I feel like I'm in that stage where I really should be creating a video a day if I want to have the most amount of impact. But I'm also, I'm tired of it and I'm, I'm not sleeping well and I'm not, I don't know, I'm not just, I'm just not feeling my full Where's self. Where's the proof and truth in creating a video a day is going to help you have the biggest impact? It's just numbers. I mean, if one video I post now will get probably 10 million views across platforms. If I post only two videos per month, which I've done this month versus 30 videos, it's just, it's a numbers game. But do numbers mean impact? In long-term impact, if you're burned out, how are you going to help people? <laughs> it's true. So I'm just proposing these questions as yeah. food for thought. But yeah. um, I create one video a week on the Pokemon channel. And I've grown faster than anybody else who's created more videos per week because I go deeper and I'm um, quality over quantity. Um, that said, there are people who upload daily, but how long can you keep that up? True. True. And we need you to be here to continue to serve people. And there, there are, there are if, if you created a video that had 10 million views, but then they didn't really have a chance to go deep with you because you had to create the next video that had 10 million views versus a video that had a, a thousand views, but every single person in that who watched that video reached out and, and wanted to hire you or um, like cried because that story resonated with them, right? So the definition of impact has to be really understood because it's you know not necessarily just about the numbers. So we have a closing tradition. The podcast is called Erica Taught Me, but really today is all about Pat Taught Me. So what do you want people to walk away from this podcast being able to say, Pat Flynn taught me this? Pat Flynn taught me, or I'm teaching you, that 
you could start small. You can help one person and learn so much from doing that. And through that process, you have to also understand that you're not going to be perfect. In fact, that's why we sort of like in science, when you are trying something, you have a little Petri dish to experiment with because, heck, things get out of control, but at least it's controlled in that one little tiny space so that you can have a better try next time or you can learn what you did wrong and do it better the next go around. Failing is okay. In fact, I often recommend people to fail faster because every fail is an opportunity for learning. Fail, as I once heard, is an acronym for first attempt in learning. So learn by failing. And that's a hard thing to do when you grow up in or when you grew up like when I grew up where it was all about being perfect. I mean, I am half Asian as well. And that culture of, you know, A minus, why not A was like very much a part of my growth. Um, And that was the hardest thing to get over. Because if you have that approach, that perfectionist approach, when building something, it's never going to come out. You're never going to help anybody. Love that. Thank you so much. Thank you. If you enjoyed today's episode, Pat has a podcast called Smart Passive Income that I'll put the link to in the show notes. And I have a huge favor to ask. It would mean a lot if you could take a moment to leave a review for the podcast. Even just one sentence is perfect, and it really helps support the work that we're doing. Thank you so much for choosing to spend your time with me today, and I'll talk to you next Tuesday on a brand new episode of Erica Taught Me.